Welcome to the next lesson in our complete intro to rendering in Blender course. Quick reminder, we're offering the entire first unit of our course for free for a limited time here on YouTube. If you're new here, I'd recommend starting at the beginning of the course. I've added a link in the description. All right, go ahead and open up Blender and let's jump right in. To begin this lesson, we'll continue with a file that we worked on from the previous video, where we covered the first step of the rendering checklist, and that was to create a render-ready Blender model. Now we created something really simple by adding the monkey mesh, adding the subdivision modifier, shading it smooth, and also adding a plain mesh and positioning it behind the monkey head. So all of those things together are a very simplified approach to creating a render-ready Blender model. And now in this video, we're gonna cover step two of the rendering checklist, and that's to set up your camera. Hey everyone, we're doing something a little unconventional here. And for a limited time, we're giving you access to the entire first unit of one of our paid courses for free right here on YouTube. And this lesson is a part of it. Blender is a beast of a program to learn, but with the right approach, it doesn't have to be. That's why we created Blender Academy, to help people build the Blender skills they need and then go out and get the jobs they want. We hope you find these lessons to be a good investment of your time. If you do, and you're serious about learning Blender, head over to our website and continue learning with us. Thanks for watching, make sure to like and subscribe, and now, back to the lesson. So again, thinking like a photographer, using that photographer method, a professional would come into a situation and they would want to think about what sort of framing do they want for their shot, what sort of composition do they want for the final shot they're going to create. And then they might adjust which camera they use and the various settings that are gonna help them produce the final shot. So we're gonna use that metaphor to help us with our camera here in Blender. So the first thing is we've noted it before, but up in the top right area here, you see the different objects that you have. Suzanne, that's the name of the monkey. So that's the monkey mesh. Then we have the plane here. We know we added that mesh as well. And you can see those little icons there. That's for the mesh geometry. We have the light, we had that by default, and we have a camera here. So when we talk about the camera, remember we're not talking about when you navigate around and that view there. We're talking about the actual object that is the camera. So if you zoom way out and you orbit a bit, you'll see this object here, this gizmo is the camera. You can click on it here to select it, or you could click on it up here in your menu and that would select it as well. Now, in order to look through this camera and to see what it sees, you can come over to the right and you'll see this little camera icon here. This is to toggle the camera view. Notice that it shows you the shortcut. So if you have a keyboard that has the number pad, you can press zero and that will pop you straight into it. Or you can click on this icon, so go ahead and do that, click here and you'll be looking through the camera. And you'll note that there's a little bit of gray area outside of a frame, and then it's a little bit more bright and full resolution inside this frame. So this frame will represent the edges of any rendering that you create. So that means if you went up to the render menu, picked it, and then picked render image, you would see exactly what is inside this frame. So the first thing that you'll need to do is you'll need to think about what is that final frame size or resolution for your image. And you can think about this in two ways. One is the aspect ratio, so how wide and how tall. And then number two is the actual resolution in pixels. So do you need something very high resolution because you're gonna be showing it in a very large format? Or does it need to be a smaller resolution because the final output will be shown in a much smaller format? So let's go ahead and talk about how to adjust this frame size. Over on the right hand side here, hovering up over near the top, you see this camera icon and then just beneath it says output. These are the output properties. Go ahead and click once and that will switch everything you see on the right to the output properties. You'll see up top we have format and we have resolution and we have aspect here. And this is where we're going to change the frame size. Now there are two ways to think about this. The first is the aspect ratio itself. So that is, how wide by how tall should your frame be? Let's say that you wanna set this such that it's a square. Come over to where it says resolution X and you can go ahead and click there and then type 1000 and press enter or return on your keyboard and it will change the size of the X resolution. So the side to side resolution there is now 1000 pixels. Then where it says Y, go ahead and click on that and let's type 1000 there again and press enter or return. And you'll notice now that the resolution box here 
is 1000 by 1000 pixels or a square. So that's a one to one ratio. Now you might see where it says aspect X and aspect Y here. And you might be tempted to say, well, if I wanted a four to three ratio, should I type four here and three here? And you certainly could, but that would be giving you four times whatever you have up here at resolution. So that would be 4,000 pixels. And then if you did the Y at three, then that would be 3,000 pixels. So if you wanted the final image to be 4,000 by 3,000, you could certainly do it in that way. But I find that just sticking to the resolution here keeps everything sensible so you don't make a mistake by multiplying things much larger than you need. Now it is worth noting that whatever this resolution is, when you go over and click on the render, render image, then that image is going to render at that number of pixels. And the larger those pixels are, so if you did 2000 by 2000 or 4000 by 4000, it will increase the render times because there's that many more pixels for Blender to calculate in the final rendering. So I always recommend that you set this resolution low while you're in the early stages of preparing and testing your rendering, especially on more complex renderings, just so that your computer can calculate those images faster. And then later on, and we'll cover this in a later step, you would set that resolution up to whatever the final resolution needs to be. For right now, we're going to go ahead and set this at 1000 by 1000. Now, once we know what sort of frame aspect ratio we want, the next thing to determine is the type of camera that we'll use. Now, you'll need to select the camera first. So come up to where you see camera in the upper right and go ahead and click on it once to select it. And then you'll notice at the lower right, if you look at all of the icons here, you'll see a camera, it'll say data when you hover over it. And this is the object data properties tab. It depends which thing you have selected up above as to whether you'll see a different icon here. So for example, if you come up and you click on the light, you'll notice that that icon down here switches to a light. And this would give you the object data properties for the light object. But we want the camera object. So go ahead and click on the camera then come down and click on the data. And that's that icon for the camera that will give you the object data properties for the camera. Now, when it comes to selecting the camera type, what I mean by that is first, we'll want to determine what sort of lens we're looking through. And we can look through one that has perspective. That's the default. Or notice that you can flip down that menu and pick orthographic. Orthographic will turn off all perspective. So this can be helpful if you're in an industry or you're trying to create a type of image that would be a plan view or an elevation view, or you just wanted all perspective turned off for some sort of an isometric view. But for our purposes, let's flip back to perspective. And then the second thing is you'll want to determine what sort of focal length you have for the lens. So this can be thought of the same way you would with a real camera, where maybe you're using a 35 millimeter lens. You could click where it says 50 millimeters and you could type 35 and press enter. And that would switch you to a 35 millimeter lens. Another thing you can do here is where it says lens unit, flip that down and you can pick field of view. Field of view is a human field of view. So what all you might see if you were looking through a human eye. And so commonly, if you're trying to think about it from the perspective of what a human might see, you might set this somewhere in the 45 to 55 degrees range. Right now, we're right up at the top of that field of view range. Of course, you could set it much wider. That would be like a fisheye lens. If you're inside, say, a hotel room trying to get a picture of the entire thing and make it look bigger, you would set that higher. You could also set it lower, and that would narrow the field of view and make things look a little bit more compressed. But for our purposes, let's go ahead and set the lens unit back to millimeters and we'll keep it at 35 millimeters for now. Okay, so we've set our frame size and we've picked our camera type, especially paying attention to the lens. The last thing we wanna do is figure out the positioning of the camera. So once again, if you go over to the viewport and you press that center mouse wheel in orbit around and then roll your mouse wheel back, the position of the camera has been preset wherever the default camera is and how it's angled and what it's looking at, that's also been preset. But we want it to be different for our particular rendering because right now, if you click on the camera icon here to look through the camera, we're gonna have a weird view where we see off into space here and the plane isn't entirely in the back. And we wanna look a little bit more in the front of the monkey and have the plane entirely covering the back of our image. Now go ahead and orbit around and zoom out so you can see the camera 
It's worth noting that if you click on it to select it, then press G for grab and move your cursor around and then click to set it down, you can move the camera using any type of tools that you would use to move meshes. So you could move the camera, you could rotate it, you can do all sorts of things like that. And while that can be useful for certain things that you'll encounter down the line, for example, maybe animating a camera along a path if you're creating an animation, that way of using it to create the perfect rendering here or the perfect positioning of the camera for what we're trying to do is going to be really cumbersome and it's going to be really hard to get the result you want. So I find the easiest method is to do the following. First, click to look through the camera. So click on that icon there. Then press N on your keyboard and this will bring out the panel here. You'll see that it defaults to the item tab and you have different transformations you could apply to the item. But what you wanna do is click on the view tab and you'll notice that under the view menu item, if it's not collapsed down, then you have to click on it to collapse it down. And then you'll notice under view lock here, once again, if it's not collapsed down, click on it so that it opens up. And you'll see that it says lock. And if you hover over the second one, it says camera to view. So this would lock your camera to your view. Go ahead and click on that checkbox. And now back over here in the viewport, if you orbit, notice that you see that the frame is still there. You're essentially navigating your view and you're locking the camera to those navigations. So it's following you around now. That means that you could zoom in and out, orbit a bit, zoom in and out, and do different types of navigations and the camera is following you the whole time. Now what's great about this is you can just use the navigation tools now to move the camera around. The downside of course is let's say that this was the perfect view. It's not, but let's just say we had the perfect view here and then I accidentally go in orbit and zoom around a bit to work on the model. Well, I've accidentally moved the camera. So you wanna be sure that you zoom yourself in and get a good view. And then when you decide that it's something that you like, and again, this isn't what I want just yet, but I'm just highlighting the point that if this is exactly what I wanted for the camera, then you come back over and you uncheck that box. Now, orbit around and zoom out and you'll notice that that camera stuck there. It didn't follow you around. So if you use this method for moving the camera around, it's definitely the easiest when you're new to Blender, but it also has that one downside, which is you have to remember to uncheck it, otherwise you'll move the position of that camera. Okay, so let's go ahead and work on getting this camera in the exact spot that we want. So let's click on the camera icon to toggle the camera view to look through it. Then over here, let's lock the view. So click on that checkbox. And now go ahead and orbit and pan and zoom your way around until you have something where the monkey feels like he or she, I should say, is in the middle of this frame. And while there are some methodologies for getting this a little more perfect than us just eyeballing it here, We'll cover those things in future lessons. Right now, I just want us to experiment with our navigation and these few tools that we have for the camera to get something that we like. Now, you're welcome to have a slightly angled view if you'd like. I'm gonna get something a little bit more close to dead on. And when I have something where I feel like it's in the middle, looks pretty nice to me, then remember to uncheck that camera lock there. And then you're looking pretty good. Now, thinking like a professional photographer, We've considered the frame, so that final output that we want. We've considered the lens, so we're looking through a 35 millimeter camera lens. And we've also positioned the camera there. Now, a photographer would also take a lot of snapshots along the way, just to make sure that all of the different settings and the different lenses are working out the way they would want. So of course, you could come up and click on render and then click render image, and you would get a sense of what you're looking at. Remembering that we have a light, we have different things going on that we haven't adjusted yet. So it's far too dark on the front of the monkey face. Things aren't looking great yet, but it's definitely showing us that our camera is being respected. The lens, the framing, and everything else. You can go ahead and close that. One thing that's worth mentioning though, is you can be far more efficient about this test render process. And that would be if you could set up the viewport so that you were looking at something that looks similar to what you would see when you click on render. And you can do that if you go up to the top right here, you'll see along the right hand corner here of your viewport, you'll see these little sphere icons. And if you hover over one of them, it says viewport shading. And so by default, you're on the viewport shading that is the solid shading. 
But if you go over two to the right, you'll see that the viewport shading, it'll say rendered there. Go ahead and click on that far right one for rendered. And you'll notice that it immediately jumps to something that looks an awful lot like the rendering that you created. So by setting your viewport to the rendered view, you'll get a pretty good look at what it'll look like when you create the final rendering. And this can be really helpful to work in this method, especially going forward with the upcoming lessons, as everything we do going forward will be about adjusting the lighting, the materials, and everything else so that this actually looks good for our final rendering. Okay, now that we've dialed in all of the settings for looking through the camera, let's go ahead and save a version of this file. Go up to File, and then pick the option for Save As. And I recommend that you save this with an incremental number. So for example, if you save the file from the previous lesson and you had an 01 at the end of it, then you would save it as the same thing with an 02 at the end or whatever the next number is in the incremental saving. I'm gonna cancel mine for now because I'm gonna save mine just a little bit later, but you can go ahead and save the file. And then when you feel comfortable with everything you've learned now, you'll be ready to move on to the next lesson where we'll talk a bit more about what's going on behind the scenes here with something called our render engine. Congratulations, you made it through the lesson. Did you find this video to be helpful? Let us know by giving it a like. If you're ready for the next lesson, you can find it in this playlist. And if you're interested in learning more about how we can help you build the skills you need, head over to blenderacademy.com. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, happy blending.